I believe the biggest problem in the world is that people don't understand themselves enough. This show is designed to help you understand your INFJ personality, heal from your past, and create a life that you love. I'm Sarah Kuhn, and this is the Quiet Ones Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here again for day three. Who's excited? I hope everybody is. This is the most excited that I've been in a while. This is how I do excited. All right, so we are going to dive right in. I hope you like this picture over here of my niece's dog. His name is Goose. My niece has um, went on vacation for, she's going to be gone for eight days. And we are on day two of just me and Goose hanging out. And I'm not a dog person. I know that probably makes me like really strange, really weird. That's totally fine. (laughs) I'm really not a dog person. So it's it's a struggle for me. <laughs> but um I keep thinking if I can just get him to stop jumping on me, um I'll like him a lot more. <laughs> so if you have any tips or tricks um to get a dog to stop jumping, please leave them in the comments of the video. I would love to hear them. Um he's a golden retriever and he's um nine months old now eight or nine months old something like that um so yeah he's kind of um kind of a mess um but we still love him um all right so i just wanted to remind you one more time we're going to be here every day at 12 p.m eastern time this week um if you haven't yet make sure that you go over to infjwoman.com slash challenge and sign up to get an account in the free portal that I have. Um, it'll give you access to all of the videos in one place uh, where you can find them really easily. And there's a couple of PDFs um, that are in there that are free as well. Um, so make sure you go over and create an account. All right. So today we're going to talk about how to persevere through failure and to reach your goals. Um, The first thing that I wanted to talk about is what is failure? How do you define failure? I really felt like the first few blogs that I posted were failures um, because not a lot of people read them and I really wasn't that proud of them. It was just me really finishing a blog post and hitting post. And now when I go back and read them, I'm kind of embarrassed of them, right? Um, The first YouTube video that I posted was, it was really bad. (laughs) I mean, the video itself wasn't bad, but there was one word and I think the word is facade. And I said it facade for some reason. And obviously that's completely wrong, but there was like five or 600 views on the video, like right off the bat. Cause I had a bunch of people on Instagram that followed me. So I told them about it and they went over and watched it. And then there's like tons and tons of comments that are all like, you said that word wrong. You pronounced that word wrong. And I was so embarrassed that I had to take the the um, video down and I re-recorded it and said the word right. And now every time I see that word, it like freaks me out because <laughs> I remember that whole experience. And I'm like, oh, how do you say that word? I would have struggled with it, you know, obviously, because I said it wrong the first time. But now it's like... I have to say it in my head about 10 times before I actually say it out loud. (laughs) And I'm still a little bit like, I think it's facade. I think that's how you say it. I know what I want to say. I'm just not certain how to pronounce it. So there have been, well, I can't even talk today. There have been plenty of blog posts that I've had, even after I had a following, even after, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of people that... Um, viewed my blog there have been blog posts that nobody liked or that nobody read um there have been instagram posts there's still instagram posts some things that i post now people don't comment on or they don't like um there are some that people make really negative comments about too um and to me those are those you know, if you look at it in the traditional sense, that would be a failure, right? If you look at it from a marketing perspective, 
if you have a post that doesn't have a lot of views, it doesn't have a lot of engagement or impressions, it's not that great of a post, right? And, you know, you could call that a failure. But there have been things that were even worse. There have been things that I've spent a lot of time and effort on um, that have flopped as well, right? I've made worksheets that nobody downloaded. I've made eBooks that nobody was interested in. I've actually created whole courses that I thought were amazing, but nobody bought them. And we're talking of like, like hours of content, tons of videos, PDFs, like the whole thing done, put together, ready to go. And nobody bought them. So when you look at it that way, really in four years, there's been a lot of failure, but you can just define failure in a lot of different ways. For me, failure is giving up. Failure is saying, okay, this isn't going to work. I have to do something else. And I'm not going to lie. There've been many, many times when I've wanted to give up. There have been many, many times where I've had to set aside my blog and do something else not just for a little while, not just for a couple of weeks, but actually for a few months because it was so much all at the same time and it just felt like I couldn't keep going. But for some reason, I always come back to it. And that for me is why I feel like it's my calling. Well, um, why I feel like it's my purpose. I just can't quit. So we talked on my podcast about... Uh, making really big goal. Um, there was an episode a few weeks ago where I talked about it a lot. And you have to make this big goal, something that's bigger than yourself, something that will take you years to accomplish. And this is really where you find a lot of meaning and purpose in your life. And for me, this is something that I did naturally. It was something um, that I've done since I was in high school. When I was in high school, I decided that I wanted to work in NASCAR. I thought for a long time I was going to be an engineer. But after a while, I decided maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. And then I found this job that was in marketing. And I really liked working in marketing. Um, this is me. I think we talked about this <laughs> the last couple of days in 2016. Um, this is a racetrack in South Carolina, Darlington. Um, and then this is one in North Carolina in Charlotte. The, um, that was a team that I used to work for. But I had this goal um, when I was in high school. I started this dreaming and planning in like 2001, probably. That was really when I fell in love with NASCAR. And I started telling people because, you know, I was in high school and people are like, well, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? And I was like, I'm going to go racing. I'm going to go work in NASCAR. And people were like, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Because I didn't grow up in one of the families that, you know, has a long history in NASCAR, which is where most people get jobs. Um, they get them from family members and from friends. I grew up in the Midwest, which is a long way from North Carolina. Um, and that's still where I was in in high school and it took me a long time years to move um to North Carolina where where the whole racing industry is I didn't move there until 2010 and you could call that a massive failure because I spent a year there and let's see I graduated from high school in 2004 right? So there's six years before, and I started dreaming about it in 2001. So that's really 10 years before I actually made the move. And then it took me about six months to get a job in NASCAR. And after about working there for about six months, I got laid off. So by December, I had to move back home with my parents. And that was the worst feeling in the whole entire world. Talk about a failure. I sp I spent a whole year thinking of myself as a failure until I decided about August or September ish, like, this is ridiculous. You're only a failure if you give up. And why are you giving up? So by January of 2012, I had figured out a way to move back to North Carolina. 
because I didn't want to be a failure. I wanted to keep going. I wanted to see if there was any other way that I could make it work. And by September of 2013, I had landed this job that I had here and I worked there for about three years and I got to go to the racetrack almost every weekend. And this thing that's around my neck that you can't really see is called a hard card, um, which is like an annual credential to get into any NASCAR event. Um, and that to me was like, okay, I, I did it. I can I accomplished this goal. Um, and it was great. But then part of it was like, okay, what's next? Like, I need a bigger goal. (laughs) I had, I had this really big goal that was impossible. And then I accomplished it through a lot of struggles, but now then what's next? So what happened to me ultimately from this job, I got laid off again. Um, And I had to, again, move back with my parents, which at that point was like super embarrassing. Like you're 30 some odd years old. You should not be doing that. Um, And it took me another year, year and a half to decide I needed another bigger goal. And that was when I moved to Boston. And this is um, a picture of me on the plane. And this is Boston. And then this is one um, driving into the city. And that was another big goal because I had never, well, I'd never been to Boston when I decided to move. And like I said, I'm from the Midwest. So my family was in Missouri at the time. Um, I spent less than 48 hours in Boston before I actually got on a plane and moved. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had no, no idea about most of the city or where to find an apartment or how to or how much it was going to cost. Um, I just knew that I had a job and I wanted to do something different. And it was one of the best decisions that I've ever made. It was scary and terrifying because as soon as I landed, I didn't know anybody in the city, right? And as soon as I landed, I had to get on what I thought was the train to go to this Airbnb that I was staying at. And so I get get off of the airplane, right? And I get the bags that I had checked and I'm going outside looking for what I thought was the Silver Line train. And it was actually a bus. And I was like, okay, this is like really confusing. But then the bus transitioned into a train which sounds really weird, but that's what happened. And so then we get off in this underground, like what is the T or the subway? Um, and I was like panicked because I had, I had ridden, I had ridden road, <laughs> been on, uh, been on a subway in England, but that was like in 2008. So it had been a hot minute since I'd been on one. Um, So I wasn't sure exactly how it worked or where I was supposed to be going. And I knew what train that I needed to be on, but I didn't know how to get there. So thankfully there was somebody there um, who worked for the T and I asked him, I'm like, how do I buy a ticket? And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, I need to take the train to this place that I'm staying. How do I buy a ticket? And he's like, you're already inside of the train station. And I'm like, yes but I need to know how to buy a ticket. And he's like, no, like you're already past the ticket place. You're already inside of the train station. You can just get on the train. And I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Well, I guess, you know, first goal accomplished. I made it. I don't know how I made it past the ticket. (laughs) I guess when you come from the airport, they give you a free ride. Like they don't make you buy a ticket. So it was very confusing and very, very scary standing inside of the subway station, waiting for the train, not knowing if it was the right train or going the right direction and, you know, going to a place that you've never been before. And everything that you own in your life is like in your hands. And I mean, it was just terrifying. There were so many things that I had to figure out, but it was also really, really exciting at the same time which is why I knew that I had to do it. Um, And then the next thing, 
starting my blog was very, very scary as well, but it felt easier than when I decided to start my podcast. So this is my podcast. It's called The Quiet Ones. And for some reason, <laughs> Apple will not update the logo, even though I have, but there it is. That's the old one. Um, When I started my podcast, it felt really, really scary because now it wasn't me just writing something. It was me having to talk about something and just sit there in front of this microphone and think about all the people that were going to hear this thing that I was saying. And it took me a good five hours, I think, to record the first 30 minute episode, which um, was a lot. But and it's been something that's almost a continuous struggle for me because there are times when I just don't feel like being that public. Um, and then there's this battle in my head of consistency, but then also, you know, not, not wanting to, to put myself out there that way. So that one for me feels like a constant struggle. Um, so the best thing that you can do when you're talking about failure, when you're talking about, you know, thinking about, is this going to work? Can I really do this? Um, before you even get started, the best thing that you can do is prepare for the dip. And what that means is you're going to have motivation at times and you're not going to have motivation at other times. You're going to be very excited and ready to go sometimes. And then other times you're just not going to feel like it, right? There's going to be a dip where you feel like you're struggling and you don't know what to do. So the best thing that you can do is prepare for the dip, right? Anticipate the struggles that are going to come up and make a plan for what to do before you even get there. I'm going to go back to the previous slide, actually, because I had a few more things to say about that. Um yeah, you're going to feel you're going to struggle unfortunately. But for me, it's easier to say that up front. It's easier to recognize it and to come to terms with it than to panic when it actually happens, right? You're going to struggle. You're going to feel lost and hopeless at times. You're going to want to quit. Um, I felt lost and hopeless when I was trying to make my first website and my second website. <laughs> and, um, you know, there were a few other times I've had some struggles with website hosting, which was painful. And um, I got blocked on Pinterest a couple of times. Um, and I panicked about it and made it a bigger deal than probably what it should have been. But I felt like I had no idea what to do. And it's like, I don't really need this right now. It would have been a lot easier for me if I would have anticipated that back then and had a plan. So now I have a really good plan of what to do when that happens, because I know it's going to happen. It happens to everybody. Um, so the best thing you can do is make a plan. What do you usually do when you hit... Um, resistance or when you hit struggles, when you are overwhelmed, when you're peopled out, what do you usually do? What helps? Um, and it helps a lot to, to write it down because usually when you're going through those moments of helplessness and overwhelm and, and feeling like you're really struggling, it's hard to remember what the plan is. So I like to write it down. And so that way, when I feel that way, then I can go back to wherever it's at and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Step one, take some time off. Step two, pamper myself a little bit. Step three, you know, probably step one should be like, make sure that you're not extremely tired and also make sure that you're not hungry because, you know, those are <laughs> like the basic things that will make you feel really, really bad. Um, but whatever it is that you do that makes you feel better, that's what you need to do. Um, that's what you need to have on your list. The next thing that you need to do, especially when you're talking about failure, is to be a C student. 
So you have to think back to when you were in school. What type of student were you? If you're anything like me, I was a straight A student. That was my whole life. It was incredibly important for me to have good grades and to do really well. I was the the kid in school who did bonus homework when you didn't need to do it. I was the one who did all of the extra credit, even though I already had 100%. I got into an argument with one teacher when I was in the ninth grade because <laughs> I did this huge project um, for one of my classes that was supposed to be extra credit. And I had done, like I'd worked on it for a whole year and I gave it to him and he was like, wow, like nobody's ever done this before. I don't even know what to say. And I'm like, cool. So where's my extra credit? <laughs> like, where's my points for it? And he's like, Sarah, I already gave you a hundred percent in the class. Like I can't give you any more than that. And I said, that's not true. I have 120% in algebra. I have 110% in English. I have 150% in science. Like you can give me more than a hundred percent. You just need to do it. So get your pencil out and start making notes <laughs> because I have a, more than a hundred percent in every other class. I want more than a hundred percent in this class too. And he was just sitting there looking at me like, why is this so important? Why does this matter to you? But to me, I was focused so much on being perfect that that's all that mattered. I wanted to be the best student in the class. It worked for me in high school, but everything changed once I got to college. When I was first in college, there were some classes that I was able to get A's in, but then I got a B. And, and I felt like the world was going to end. And then I got a C and I was like, how is it that I barely passed this class? And then I failed a class. And I, I thought the world was going to end on a whole new level. I was so embarrassed that for the longest time, I wouldn't even tell people that I failed it. I didn't even tell my parents that I failed it. I just signed up for the class the next semester and thankfully they had this program where if you you pass the class or you fail the class one semester if you take the class the next semester and you pass it they'll just replace your old grade with the new one so thankfully i was able to pass it the second time um but it was really devastating for me um, and I realized at that point that my whole identity didn't revolve around me having straight A's. It didn't need to. You can still be a good person and have a C. You can still be a good person and fail a class. You, you can still be smart. You can still be intelligent. You can still be educated. You can still be all of the things that you want to be and not be an A student. You just need progress, right? You don't need to be perfect, especially when that comes to writing, especially when it comes to blogging. It doesn't need to be perfect. There are so many people that I know that want to write, um, but they don't want to put something out in the world unless it's perfect. Somebody asked me how long it takes me to edit my blog posts because they had a blog post that they've been editing for like two or three weeks and they still weren't sure that it was ready to go. And I said, they were shocked and surprised when I said, I don't edit my blog posts. If I edited them, they would never get published. I would just start questioning what I had written and why I had written it. And I would just start tearing it apart and it would never, ever get published. And they were like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. So I told them, like, you need to just stop where you're at and publish it because it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be what you think that it should be. You have to let go of perfectionism and embrace the fact that you're doing something new and it's going to be messy. You're going to make mistakes. There are going to be things that you don't know how to do, but that's okay because you don't need to be perfect. 
You just need to get things done. You just need to publish your first blog post. It's going to be messy. It might be terrible, but that's fine because you've got the first one done. Your blog posts might not be good until you've posted 50 of them or maybe even 100, but you can't get to that 100th one until you post the first one, until you post the second one, until you post the third one. It's better now, before you even get started, to embrace being a C student and to start making progress than to stick to the perfectionism because the perfectionism will hold you back every single time. It will keep you stuck exactly where you're at right now. And the point of starting a blog is not to stay stuck. It's to keep moving forward, even if it's messy. So you don't need to be perfect. You just need progress, right? Make the messy version. So I want to circle back to something that we talked about on Monday, which is investing in yourself. And just a little bit of a review. On Monday, we said, you know, you don't, or let's see, we said we have to stop saying that we can't afford it, right? Um, I have to stop saying I can't afford to get my hair done when, when I get my hair done, it makes me feel like a million bucks, right? It makes me feel like a whole new person. And honest to God, after I, um, after we did that, um, that workshop, I went and made a hair appointment (laughs) because I'm sure that you could tell from the video that I did yesterday, it's been a minute since I've had my hair done. And after I was telling you guys all of this, I was like, you know what? It's been a while and I need to stop saying that I can't afford it. Um, I can't afford it. Like, how can you not afford it? When it makes you feel amazing, how can you not afford it, right? So when you talk about starting a blog, can you really afford to go it on your own? When I started my blog, there were a lot of struggles. I not only am have I worked in digital marketing for about 10 years, I've been a graphic designer for even longer than that. Really since since I was in high school, probably, um, which oh my gosh, it's probably about like 22 years now. Um, but when it came to building a website for myself, because you know, you need a place to host your blog, and I wanted my own website. I really struggled with figuring out how to set it up. It was a massive disaster on a few different occasions. There was one time where I had a problem with a hosting company where they deleted my whole website and I had to start over again. Um, And it was really bad. I was in tears and I had no idea how to get started. Of course, I didn't have a backup of it. Obviously, (laughs) it was terrible was really bad. I struggled in the beginning to get readers. Um, I didn't know how to promote my blog effectively. I didn't know which social media channel would be the best. I struggled to figure out social media. Every time I got on a new uh, platform, it was like, okay, what works best for this platform? And sometimes there's testing that you have to go through. And, um, you know, even if you're looking at at other people, what they're telling you. Some people are saying post three times a week and other people are saying post three times a day. Well, how do you know what works? And then it's like, well, what graphics work best? Is it better to do videos or graphics? Is it better like Instagram now has reels, which are kind of like TikTok. And do you need to do reels? Is that really important? And then some people talk about buying ads too. Do you need to buy ads? Do you need to spend money on that? Is that important? One of the biggest things that I've struggled with too is how to make money. When I first started and I realized, hey, you have a business here. I really wanted to make money. I needed to make money. I needed a second income or, you know, and I even wanted to work from home. That was before the pandemic when nobody was working from home, really. But I struggled with how to make money. Like I said before, I made whole courses 
that are like 12 week courses full of videos and PDFs and all that stuff. And nobody wanted to buy them. And that was a massive, massive struggle for me. It would have been so much easier if I would have had somebody there who could show me the way. So I want to ask you, can you really afford to go it on your own? Can you afford to struggle to figure out all of those things alone? Can you build your own website? Can you figure out your social media? Or would it be better to have someone who's been there to show you the way? I think it would be a whole lot better. And if there was somebody that would have been my same personality type, that would have been even better. One of my favorite um, people who's a... um, a business coach, I guess you would say. Um, Actually, the person that I took the business course from a couple of years ago, she's fantastic. But the problem for me with working with her is she's outgoing. She's a people person. So she loves doing live videos and she loves selling things to people. And she doesn't understand why I don't. (laughs) And so... It would be so much better if I had an INFJ coach, right? Because the benefits of having a coach who's the exact same personality type as you are, they understand you. They know exactly what you want to do and what you don't want to do and why you're not comfortable with that, why you may not be comfortable with it, right? They can relate to all of those things. You don't have that disconnect of working with somebody who's extroverted or working with somebody who isn't very planned and organized. And somebody who's an INFJ can find ways to work with your strengths rather than just doing what everybody else tells you to do. So I wanted to tell you about something really special that I've been building for a while now that I'm super excited about. Um, It's a new program that I have that's called Blog School. Um, And it is six weeks to helping you build your own blog, to helping you figure out exactly what your thing is and figuring out how to make it exactly what you want it. So whether that is a side hustle or a new full-time income, blog school is going to help you set that up and get it going. Um, This is the page for it, which you can find at infjwoman.com slash blog school. That's going to tell you all about everything, all six of the modules, all of the bonuses. It'll walk you through whether it's right for you or not. Um, And then it'll talk to you about, um, answer some of your questions about where it's hosted, um, the refund policy and all of those things. So basically there's six different things that we'll go through. Um, By the end of the program, you'll have figured out exactly what the perfect topic for you is for blogging. Um, Some people call this your niche. We'll help you get a website built and help you start creating content. So we're going to help you figure out all the tech for the websites, everything um, that you need for whichever one that you decide um, on. Um, cause there's a lot of different options for websites. Um, I actually started out on WordPress and then I moved to a site called, um, word, uh, lead pages. And then now my blog is hosted on Wix actually. Um, so there's a lot of different options and I have built websites and like I said, I've built like 10 different websites for <laughs> for my blog. So I can tell you the best and the worst things about each one of them. Um, We're also going to walk through establishing um, and attracting your ideal audience, right? We talked about having an engaged audience. Um, We're going to get you established in creating um, consistent content, right? And make sure that you, um, you have a good writing practice. Um, we're going to talk about a marketing plan and how you're actually going to make money. Um, and then we're going to set up how you sell, sell things and make sure that you're comfortable, uh, whether you're interested in doing live launches or whether you would do, uh, you'd rather do like email marketing or social media or whichever way works best for you. There's a lot of different ways. There's also an exclusive bonus for the first 10 people who sign up. I know that a lot of people struggle with websites, right? And I don't want that tech 
piece of your blog to hold you back from anything. So I've built a lot of different websites because I really like building websites. Like I said before, I like big challenges and I like to figure those types of things out. So I've decided that for the first 10 people who sign up, I'm going to give you a website that is designed and done. All you'll have to do is buy a domain name and then purchase um, the hosting, but the website is completely done for you. Um, and then I'm also going to give you two hours of consultation. So I'll help support you with creating a logo, choosing your color scheme, choosing all the fonts, and then making sure that you know exactly how to run your blog too, which is super easy. Um, and I'm going to make sure that it's on the best platform that is really, really easy. You won't have to do hardly anything to it. Um, you'll just be ready to go basically. All right. So we're going to talk a lot more about blog school tomorrow for today. I'm going to give you just a little bit of homework. I want you to go back to talking about prepare for the dip, right? I want you to make a plan for what to do when you hit the resistance, when you feel like you want to quit, um, when you're just feeling like this isn't the right thing, make a plan for that. What do you do when you feel really bad, when you feel really overwhelmed and figure out those exact steps, write it down in a place that you can get to it so that when you feel that way, you know exactly where to go to get to that. And then the other thing too, is to check out blog school. Um, I'm going to post the link for it, but you can see the link here at the bottom of the screen. It's infjwoman.com slash blog school. Um, and then of course I will see you back here tomorrow at 12 PM Eastern time. We are going to talk about eight ways to monetize your blog. All right. Oh, and I wanted to remind you too, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them in the comments. Um, I'm going to answer some questions before we get started tomorrow. Um, so if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them there. And I always come back and check in on the comments. Um, so if you have any questions, um, or any comments, make sure that you put them in there. All right. I will see you again tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining me.